I got an idea. Welcome to another episode of the Electric Sheep Podcast. I'm your host, Simpson. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest, Paul Jorgensen. Uh, he's a YouTube YouTuber. He is uh, the host of the Lang Focus YouTube channel. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure, sure. Good to see you. Um, okay, man. So let's just uh, get right into it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, background? Sure. Yeah, I'm from Canada originally, mm -hmm. but I've spent a lot of my life outside of Canada. Um, I guess the first time I went abroad is when I was in university, when I spent about a year of my life in Israel. Um, and while, while I was there, uh, I learned Hebrew and I learned some Arabic as well. And that sort of um, sparked my, my passion for languages, just the enjoyment of the process of, of learning Hebrew and, and Arabic to the extent that I, I learned it back then. Nice. Um, so I was in university and in university, I majored in the English language for my first degree, I majored in the English language, not literature, but actually like the structure of the language and the history of the language and that kind of thing. And I, I minored in religious studies, but wow. I didn't really study religion. I just used that as my, my opportunity to study biblical Hebrew and biblical Aramaic. So it tied just into your past experience. That's right. Yeah, it was, um, I was just into the languages and it related to Hebrew. I had learned modern Hebrew but I wanted to learn biblical Hebrew by extension and biblical Aramaic is related. Um, and it was just an extension of my new passion for languages. Um, so after finishing that degree, I did an education degree and moved to Japan after that and studied Japanese in advance of moving to Japan. Um, and since then I've studied other languages. Uh, languages are sort of my passion. I've studied a few in depth and I've dabbled in a lot of others, just um, a little bit here and there. And, and I'm interested in linguistics in general as well. So that's sort of, you know, my background um, in terms of my interests that you see on the Lang Focus channel. Right, right. So I guess that ties into my next question. So what inspired you to get into the language space, I guess, um, particularly as a creator? Yeah, I was teaching English as a foreign language at a university. Uh, as you know, mm -hmm. but I wasn't really satisfied with that as a long-term career track, even though I enjoyed it. Um, I just, I didn't feel like I was learning as much as I could. And I felt like I was limited in what I could do, um, both in terms of helping the students learn and also just kind of being interested in the content that I was teaching myself. So I started Lang Focus basically to make my life more interesting by talking about topics that I could get into. Um, and using that as an opportunity for, for me to learn myself. Right. So the way I approach the channel is basically like I delve into a topic and learn as much as I can about it. And then I share it with the audience. So it's not really like, I'm not trying to be professorly like this is the knowledge and I'm imparting it unto you. It's not really like that. It's just like, I'm doing a project and I'm going to share it with you and see what you think and see if you can learn something from it at the same time that I do. That's really how I approach it. Well, obviously it's working. You have over uh, 1.3 million subscribers. <laughs> yeah, 1.3 million. I don't really value the number of subscribers. I shouldn't say I don't value it. Um, maybe I, I don't assign too much meaning to the number of subscribers because a lot of people just click the subscribe button and then don't watch again, right? Especially well, on a, a diverse channel like mine where there are so many different topics. Some people just want to learn about Spanish. Some just want to learn about French or whatever. Um, and if your next video isn't on that, they don't come back. So <laughs> the number of subscribers is a bit of a mirage, but, but yeah, it's I doing it's okay. A very humble way to look at it though. That's great. Uh, so the next question, what, how, how do you go about optimizing your videos, like titles, thumbnails, and what key metrics do you look at? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess there's what you should do if you want to be successful and then there's what you actually do. So there's a bit of a, a difference there. I think I've sold myself short in terms of optimizing the titles and, and thumbnails because I wanted my channel to be taken seriously. Um, I wanted it to be like a channel where people actually learn and not just an entertainment channel. Um, but I'm starting to see like the value and actually getting attention to the videos before you educate people. So I'm starting to go back and retweak things and optimize a little bit more. Um, so titles are important. 
like I have a lot of titles on my channel, like for example, the Hungarian language. That's it. That's the title. Right. That video is done okay because people know what it's about. But if it had a snappier title, I think more people would click on it and then learn from the video. Right. Um, I've noticed one of your titles, uh, the confused Canadian. And then yeah, the, like uh, that kind of thing. Lately, I've been trying to use more clever titles that catch people's attention, like um, confused Canadian investigates Australian English. So if an Australian sees that, they want to click on it and see what, you know, the this Canadian guy thinks, and then it's like a self-deprecating joke. He's a confused Canadian. So it's just kind of, it might make them laugh and then click. Um, and then the thumbnail for that video, I think I look confused and I'm staring at um, an Aussie, a, flag, a, a map of Australia with an Aussie flag or something. Um, and I have a question mark over my head. So I look confused. So that was sort of a, you know, a, an attempt to make a clever thumbnail more, more catchy than usual. But it does make a huge difference in your click-through rate right? Like one of the metrics on YouTube that's important for getting your videos out to more people is the click-through rate. So if the title and thumbnail catch people's attention and the percentage of people who click when they see your thumbnail goes up, YouTube will push your video out to a lot more people. And sometimes it's not just like a few more people. They'll push it out to way more to see if it holds that click-through rate. I see. Um, so if you get a 1% click-through rate, the video will probably just die because they'll start showing it only to like your smallest core audience. But if it gets a 10% click-through rate, they'll just keep pushing it out as far as they can until the click-through rate goes way down. And then they'll stop at that point. So are you saying that uh, the, a threshold, like a key threshold is 10%? Um, not exactly 10%. I think 10% would be a ridiculously high one. But like on my channel, if I get like, if I'm getting 5%, they really keep pushing it out. And then if it goes down like below four, it starts to slow down. And then if it gets like below three, that gets already probably at its maximum audience. But there's one video I changed the thumbnail and title for recently. And right. basically it's getting like 10 times as much traffic now as it used to. Um, so I can show you if you want, I can sure. share the screen and show you what change I made, which is really not a huge change. Can you see this yep. on the screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this is a thumbnail of a video I made like three years ago. It's about a constructed language called Tokipona. It's a language with 123 words. That's its basic vocabulary. Wow. That's sort of the idea of the language. And the title was Tokipona, the language of good, because that's what Tokipona means in that language. It means language good. So that was the thumbnail and the title. And it got some views, but you know, never went crazy but I changed it to this just recently, like a month ago, I changed the title to the world's tiniest language. And then in parentheses, Tokipona. So the name of the language is at the end because nobody's heard of it. Um, and I called it the tiniest, uh, the world's tiniest language, tiniest that catches your attention because it's a superlative. Right. People wonder like, what does that mean? A tiny language. And then on the thumbnail, I put this, like this language has almost no words. Right. And that makes people wonder, like, how can a language have almost no words? And then there's an arrow pointing down to the center of the thumbnail. Right. So it's changing the title and putting that caption at the top of the thumbnail increased the click through rate enough that it's getting like 10 times as many views. Wow. And at the moment, wow. it's my That's number one video, even though it's three years old. Wow. Yeah. So you can always go back and rework your t titles and thumbnails, right? Yeah, you can. Um, so your video isn't necessarily like relegated to, to the, the trash bin if it didn't do well at first, right? You can exactly. go back and re-optimize things, which I'm trying to do right now. Yeah. I've done that in the past as well. I've gone back and uh, looked at uh, some search trends and uh, changed the titles, changed the thumbnails. And yeah, it does make a difference. I haven't gotten a 10 times a performance like yourself, but I've gotten a, you know, I've gotten a bit of a bit of a bump. Yeah. I'm going back through all my videos and I'm looking for others that could have that kind of, you know, resurgence. But I think that one in particular, that one just has a, a cool idea behind it. Like the world's tiniest language. It's exactly. most of my other videos don't have like that unique idea. Exactly. Uh, that could blow up, but uh, I might be able to tweak something here and there. So what, what about um, audience retention? How, how, how uh, important or how much do you focus on that uh, metric? 
because uh, you know, in my videos, I'm you know, I, I, I yeah, it's it's something I definitely struggle with. Like, I can see like a key point where the audience drops off, and I, you know, it's 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 difficult to structure uh, your videos around the audience retention. But I know, you know, I've heard it talked about many times. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. The click through rate is like the first the first metric, like the first thing that gets them to your video. But if they don't stay and watch much of it, then YouTube won't keep pushing it out to more people. They'll, um, they'll only keep recommending it if it has a good enough retention rate or like the length of time people watch. Um, yeah. So to improve the retention rate, I mean, I think it depends on, on the creator. Like some people have entertaining videos and if the creator is entertaining enough and they have a fun personality or whatever, maybe people are engaged by that. Um, in my case, I thought like, I'm not that entertaining. So I need to like focus on visual stuff. Um, I keep people engaged with a lot of visual activity on the screen. So that includes like showing images, showing maps, right. showing some graphics that move a little bit, showing text on the screen when I'm narrating color coding the words that I'm talking about or right. like um, highlighting them on the screen uh, so to keep people like following along. Presentation. Yeah. So I try to make it visually engaging. And I did that to a certain extent with music as well, like trying to have a music track underneath and have it like um, come in and drop out at certain points that keep people engaged. That one's a bit trickier because some people hate having music in a video, especially <laughs> if it's like an educational video, they want to listen carefully. Right. Um, but for people who are casually interested, the music can be good. Just it makes it feel like entertainment to them. So, yeah, I think also another key thing would be like expectation. Like if you call expectations, if you call your video, you know, one thing and then you click on the video and then uh, I think people want to feel like, or at least me, I want to feel like if I, if I, if this title is titled this something, I want to click on it and I want to feel like I'm getting what I expected to get. And I want to kind of get that. And I want to at least see um, uh, evidence of that kind of like more towards the front end of the video. Mm -hmm. And if not, I might click off. Right. Yeah. And that's the whole problem with clickbait. Clickbait used to work like misleading people into clicking on the, the video and then not giving them what they were promised. Uh, it used to work a few years ago, but people were getting annoyed and leaving the videos early. So YouTube added that extra me metric of um, retention rate or watch time to yeah. sort of balance that out. Um, yeah, so I think like with my videos, I try to get their attention with the thumbnail and title. And then I think just by default, the videos deliver on that because I'm talking about what I say I'm talking about in yeah, the titles. Exactly, like you've actually like studied that language and you're gonna give them an in-depth uh, review of what you what your title's called, what your video is called. Yeah, so I think like the part I struggle with with retention rate um, is just that the videos are too long and get too deep uh, and too detailed, which is kind of it's what the core audience wants, or some of the core audience wants, because they're really into linguistics or languages, uh, you know, language nerds who really want to go in deep. Um, but the, the wider audience, like a more casual audience, they're not interested in that. And they click off of the video when I start to get a bit too deep. So I think the average watch time on one of my videos is like six minutes, even though the videos tend to be 16 minutes. And some people click off like immediately in the first 10 seconds. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's normal on, on all videos, all channels. Exactly. Like, um, but that would mean a lot of people are clicking off probably around like the 10 minute mark. So mm -hmm. it's like, that's still pretty good though. Yeah. I mean, th that means they're watching like the, the basic information about the language, the history of the language and that sort of thing. And then like the first more general description of the language, but when it starts to get into like the syntax and breaking down sentences, they're overwhelmed and they click off. So, so I guess it's it, the balance. Yeah. So it's, between your general and your hardcore viewers. Yeah. And I'd like to simplify the videos to sort of, increase that that retention rate but the risk there like psychologically it's difficult to make that change because you know you might lose some of the core audience you might gain a lot more followers in general but will they be as committed as the core audience that's sort of the, the dilemma there
So is there, is there something specific in your videos that like hook people um, in terms of like uh, something that you do or something that, is, that you've noticed in the past that this, this will hook uh, a viewer? I think it, I mean, it, it basically depends on the topic. The topic is the first thing that catches their attention and gets them to get into the video. Um, and I think that it depends on, on the viewer, which topic they want to see. So a lot of my, um, when you say hook, do you mean hook, like, uh, like a hook point inside the video, like something? Yes. That... Yes. Yeah. A hook point inside the video. Okay. Um, I'm starting to change the way I do the introductions to my videos because I think I was, uh, I think I, a lot of people were leaving because I gave the same introduction every time. But like I would say, like, welcome to the Lang Focus channel. And my name is Paul. And I would do that every time. And some people would, the people who watched regularly were like, okay, we're expecting that. And so <laughs> they thought it was cool. It was like, it became a meme, right? This and funny they, thing they, I always said. They would comment on, they would like give you feedback about that? Yeah, and people still write it on, on Twitter and stuff. They'll like they'll just tweet one of my videos and they'll write like, welcome to the Lang Focus channel and my name is Paul. Uh, I think the, one of, the first time I said it, I just said it without thinking. And I said, and for some reason, just I was, I don't know why I said and in the middle. I said, welcome to the Lang Focus channel and my name is Paul. People think it sounds weird that I use and in the middle rather than split it into two sentences. So they're always, they kind of make fun of it, but it's, it's become a, a meme. Way. It's just a casual way to talk in conversation. Right. That's what I thought. I just said it without thinking. Um, but people who don't really follow me don't know why I'm saying that and they don't know why I'm introducing myself. So I just realized, okay, it, there's probably better retention if I don't do that and just start getting into the topic right away. So these days I just start, um, I just jump into the topic. Like today we're going to talk about the Guarani language and, you know, get right into it. You're absolutely right about this introduction stuff. The introduction, it's, it seems like something that's so basic and so simple, but like, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a new YouTuber myself and, and I, I have struggled with that too. Like, I, I don't, I, like, and I watch other people, how they start their videos. Some guys use the same introduction. Some guys just jump right into it. And yeah, you don't know which way to go sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way is just to jump right into it. I, I do too. I think so. Yeah, I mean, because you're trying to get people hooked right away. Um, some of them don't know who you are, and some of them are, some of them are just like clicking through multiple videos to see if something like answers their question or gives them what they want. So if you don't give it within ten seconds, they'll click out and find a different video, right? And I know I've done that myself. Exactly. People have a very short attention span these days with all the options for uh, for, for content. Right. Um, so but how do you come up with uh, your ideas for your videos, like your topics? I've got a long list of topics that I want to talk about at some point, because the theme of the channel is languages in general. Right. There are 7,000 languages in the world, more or less, you know, approximately. Okay. Um, so it's just endless topics to talk about and not just, not just uh, like language profiles, but I can do language comparisons and I can talk about the languages of certain countries and do an, a profile of that country, um, that kind of thing. So I've, just, I've got a, a long list of topics, but the way I choose the next one on the list, the way I choose what to do next is basically like the one that I'm excited to do next because each video is a lot of hard work and to get through the hard work. You need to really want to do it. Exactly. Um, so I choose the one I'm excited to do, but there is to a certain extent, it's influenced by what I think people will want to see. Um, like some videos bomb and that's okay if some of them bomb um, but I don't want all of them to bomb because the channel <laughs> won't succeed so yeah, if like I know that. exactly like sometimes I think it will bomb but I do it anyway because I really want to do it and then sometimes I'm like you know I, I'm fairly excited about the topic but I know it will bomb so I, I put it off for another time and I do a topic that you know is more balanced so uh, again, yeah, so see those kind of talks, you need to really like assess your energy level and your mood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And some of them, some of them work out well, like sometimes they don't bomb when you think they will. Like yeah, I did a video on, on Patois, Jamaican Patois, which yeah. I was excited to do and I was convinced it would bomb. I thought no one would be interested, but then, you know, basically all of Jamaica saw it, I think. And <laughs> a lot of the, <laughs> the uh, diaspora in the United States and elsewhere um, shared it and it, it did quite well. 
Wow. Yeah. So you never know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that, that's cool. Like, so how do you know? Like, yeah, it's like, very, it must be very interesting for you because you might like, like, even though obviously, you know, most languages are spoken by a, a fairly large group of people, I would imagine, like, you don't know uh, if, you know, how it's going to do because even if, because it, it could be, you know, obscure type of a language, right? So you don't really know. Yeah. I mean, I have a sense of it, but sometimes I'm wrong, right? Like there are certain languages that are, are minor, but if you make a video on it, like minor, I mean, like not spoken by tons of people, but if you make a video on it, everyone who speaks the language will get excited about it, or maybe not all of them, but a lot of people will, right? The first time that happened was with the Basque language. So I made a video about Basque, not really knowing how enthusiastic its speakers were about promoting it and, and preserving it, right? So when I made that video in 2016, that was my first video to blow up and, and get hundreds of thousands of views. Wow. So that must have kicked off something pretty exciting and uh, for you. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first time I really thought, okay, this could, could be a big channel and I'm onto something. Right. Exactly. Cool. Um, so what are some common misconceptions creators have about YouTube? And I'm sure there's lots of people that think this, think that. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, a lot of people, especially people who do vlogs or they do personality based videos, I think they underestimate the importance of the topic or the theme of the video. So they kind of just film their life and cut it up in the video editor. And they think like, okay, this is like what other YouTubers do. Right. But other YouTubers who are successful usually have like a theme or some kind of story that unites all the pieces of their day that they film, right? Yeah. Like, like Casey like, Neistat. Like yeah, he, right. Like he, there's a lot going on in there, even though it looks pretty seamless. Right. Yeah, and he probably just finds some way to, to unite them, to have a story behind them, or at least there's some kind of goal in the video. Yeah, like, like there's a payoff at the end and stuff like that. Right. Like I remember some of his video titles would have something in them. Like I remember one was like, um, what was it? It was like, I flew to Indonesia to meet the president. Or something like yeah, that. Right? Like that's so, a good potential. Yeah. So in the video, I remember like he only talked to the president for like 15 seconds in the video, but the whole journey of getting there was part of the story, right? Yeah. So there's something uniting all all the events of that day. Um, but people who are starting YouTube, they think, okay, you can just film yourself and it's interesting. Um, but people might not be interested unless you connect the pieces somehow. So like they might do, I bought a new dog. <laughs> but no one cares. Right. So, but if they gave it a story and tried to sort of, you know, connect the pieces thematically, like I bought a new dog and life is hell. And then, right. and you know, they, they connect show. the pieces. Right. Yeah. Like they show the dog spilling his food on the floor. They show the dog barking at night so they can't sleep and you know, the, all the disruptions to their routine. Then it has a story and it's more interesting. Right. Exactly. So I guess what you're saying is people underestimate the value or the, underestimates the power of story yeah story or theme at least like i don't have i try to give my videos a bit of a story like in the general background and historical part of the video um but at least there's a theme and a topic right that can keep people engaged it's not just um talking about everything or showing random stuff that happens exactly there's something to focus it do you have like a a certain kind of a format that you use in your videos or do you just kind of do whatever i have a general sort of format like especially when i do language profiles a video all about one language i have like the general information about the language and then i go in to its history and development and then i start going into its features after that right um and for the features i, I typically start simple and then kind of get deeper and deeper um like I, I often start with basic phrases or pronunciation and then i go on to like um, grammar and verb tenses. And then I get to full sentences, long sentences at the end that I break down. Uh, so it sort of gets progressively more, uh, progressively deeper, I guess, as you go into the video. Um, so yeah, that's, this, this perfect, this ties into my next question is like, how do you do your research before you even get started? Yeah. I mean, for, 
for language profiles, I tend to like start researching online. Like I'll look for a lot of online resources. These days you can find digital books and you can find like academic papers and that kind of thing. And also a lot of instructional websites, people who are teaching their own language. And you can find discussions about languages like on Quora and things like that. You get a lot of insightful um, answers to questions there. Um, so I do a lot of research online and I have a lot of language books too. So I use my own books to research stuff. And I come up with a list of, uh, a list of example words and sentences that I think demonstrate the core features of the language. Uh, and then I, I use those examples and I build a script around them. So I sort of you know, write the script around those examples so that it sort of flows between them. Um, and then I demonstrate the general features of the language that I learned from that research. So you script everything out based yeah. around these uh, touchstones. That's right, yeah. And I don't think all the viewers realize that I do that. For me, it's kind of, it's crazy that they don't realize that because that's a lot of, a lot of work. And I know that I couldn't just talk off the top of my head about those topics. Of course, but it you seems, have to be researched. Yeah, but a lot of people seem to assume that I'm just turning on the camera and, and starting to talk with no preparation, which is crazy. So they think, wow, this guy's a genius. But I say, no, I'm not a genius. I just work, on, work hard on my videos. And I don't know all this stuff before I start, right? Um, so that's really, that's the research stage. That's the hardest part, the research and the writing of the script. Filming is pretty easy. Uh, I mean, that's just like an hour out of out of a hundred or however many hours I spent. Is that how long you take? Uh, like, what's the average? If you can say, like, what's the average total like of a, of a video you take to, to create? Well, these days it's kind of out of control, so it keeps getting higher and higher. It's probably like two hundred hours or something crazy. Wow! If I include if I include all the all the stages and all the editing and all the all the consultation with with people and fixing things and yeah it's a long it's usually like a month a month if i'm at it every day you sound like a like a mr beast <laughs> yeah mr beast is a yeah he's a beast um yeah i mean it's it's a bit excessive for the types of video that i make but it's sort of um i guess i i fell into the trap of trying to do more and more each time um one up so yourself yeah, trying to one up myself, but not always in the, the best way. Like I tried to make, like I tried to include more every time because every time I made a video, people would say, why didn't you mention this? Or, what about this? And so in the next video, I'd feel, oh, I have to include more detail. And then they got to this point now where they're excessively detailed and there are often languages I don't know much about before I start researching. So I have to learn a lot about a language that's completely new to me. So at some point I want to, well, at some point, um, I want to simplify them. It's just hard to make that jump because of audience expectations. Okay, Paul. So, uh, yeah, so that leads my, me to my next point. I guess there's a bit of crossover here. Um, is there uh, anything that's uh, unique to your filming or editing process? Yeah, I guess the, I mean, the main thing about the editing process would be that I create a lot of images like full screen images um, outside of the editing software. Uh, like I create basically infographics that I show on the screen and people aren't sure how I do that. Um, they think I'm doing it inside like Vegas pro or something, but that I, would be super, it's super hard to make, you know, like creative documents inside a editing program. It's best to like just do it on Photoshop or even in keynote or, mm -hmm. or PowerPoint. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I use Photoshop, or um, I have another one that's called, uh, what was it? Pick.net or something. And mm -hmm. I use PicMonkey sometimes, with, mm -hmm. um, just different photo editing software. Mm -hmm. um, so I can create these images that I show on screen. Um, that's usually when I'm showing the language features. Right. And some other things too, like maps and stuff. Sometimes I adjust the maps and I do those in Photoshop and import them into the editing software. Right. How about your uh, filming process? Like, do you use like, uh, I noticed you have a lot of like, you're, you're standing and uh, in front and then behind you, you're showing lots of graphics and stuff. So do you, you're using like a green screen or, and what kind of camera are you using? And Yeah, I've got a green screen behind me. Um, 
for the camera, I just use a, a simple digital camera. Um, I forget the model name, but it's a Sony digital camera. It's right. not like a, a DSLR, uh, just a regular digital camera, a small one. Um, yeah, I use a green screen behind me so I can put like the, the classroom image behind me or I can change to scenery images and that kind of thing sometimes, um, which I do occasionally. But I think like the, the biggest thing about my filming process that's different is just like, because I'm, I'm reciting a script, I end up saying the same things over and over while I'm filming because when you're writing the script, it's hard to imagine how easy it is to say the sentence. So sometimes like, it's a <laughs> densely written sentence. And when I'm trying to say it while filming, I'm like, oh, damn, I didn't think it would be this hard to say this long sentence with exactly. proper natural intonation. I so I end up understand what you're saying. Yeah. So when I, I attempt to say it, I'm like, okay, that didn't sound natural at all. Let me try again. And sometimes I say like each sentence, not each sentence, but I say some of the sentences five times. And then when I'm editing, I have to cut down to the best takes. Right. Time. So essentially you're just basically you're rehearsing the sentence because you didn't realize how the difficulty of, uh, you know, saying it, right? Right. So it might be better if I just rehearse the entire script a couple of times before I film. Instead of like rehearsing each line one, one by one. Right. Yeah. But I think like it, because I take a long time to write the script, I'm often hurrying at the end. I'm like, oh, damn, <laughs> I'm, I've, I've got to film this soon. I've got like two hours to film this. Go. And then... Uh, I don't rehearse it before I start. So yeah, I'm basically rehearsing as I film. And then that means I have to really cut the footage. Right. Um, so like, it's pretty good. If you're taking like one or two hours to film it, like that's pretty good. Like to, cause I was like, geez, I was, sometimes I was taking like two hours to film. Well, I'm quite new at YouTube, but so I was taking like one or two hours to film like a five or six minute video. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, because I was running into all sorts of problems that like, like you, I didn't realize how this difficult it would be to say the sentence uh, in my previous videos, I was using like a, uh, a tablet and the pen. And I didn't realize how hard it would be to coordinate. It's, it's very hard to do other things while you're talking. Mm -hmm. Like if you're trying to do different, all these different things at one time, it's diff it's more difficult. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And that's something I've, I've noticed while doing live streams. That's part of the reason I don't do live streams very often it's because there's a lot of different things happening and it's hard to stay focused on what you're trying to say because exactly. you've got like super chats coming in and you've got, <laughs> you know, comments just coming in rap at rapid fire, uh, rapid fire pace. And, you know, you've got to manage the technical side while you're speaking. Exactly. So, yeah. It's hard. When, when I when I have to manage a technical side while I'm speaking, it, for me it, it kind of uh, I kind of default back to my like teacher voice mm -hmm. instead of like more of a you know just kind of free willy freestyle kind of like natural voice. Right. So it, yeah, it really it really for me it really affects the cadence of my voice if if I have too much to do. Right. So, um, so Paul, how do you like you you know you've been going for you you've had this channel going for what five six years now. Uh, seven years, I guess. Yeah, started in 2000, 2015. Wow. Wow. So I guess that leads to, to this question. Like, how do you keep things engaging and fresh over time? Yeah, that can be hard. Um, I mean, to some extent, I do that through the choice of topic. True, true, true. Like, because it's a different topic all the time. Like, if my channel was all about English, I might kind of go crazy. Um because it's just, you know, I can't really change directions and try something new or that exactly. kind of thing. But by changing topics, just doing a new language I've never talked about, I can keep it fresh to some extent. Um, but the, the format, doing the same format over and over also is a bit hard. That makes it hard to stay engaged. Um, so when I do videos on a simpler topic, like if I do a video on English, which I do now and then, um, I can be more creative with um, the video. I can put more energy into making it funny or making it, you know, just more of an interesting, entertaining video. Right. And that keeps it fresh too. So I wish I could do a bit more of that. Just sometimes the videos have too much detail and they get too serious. So it's hard to put as much effort into the creative side of it. But I think that's, that's kind of more the direction I'd like to take it to keep it fresh. Right. Just yeah, keep that's things good. a little lighter and more creative. It, you know, that it helps you out too, right? In terms of like staying light. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's the benefit of not being burnt out as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So like you said, you started your channel in 2015, right? So yeah, now we're in 2022. And so would you say, is it too late to start a YouTube channel in 2022? And what advice would you give someone who wanted to start today? Yeah, I don't think it's too late. Um, I think there's more competition now. There are more people doing YouTube and there are more channels that have like a million subscribers and that kind of thing. Um, but there, there are also more resources for people who want to do it. Like there are channels that basically explain like how to do YouTube. Right. Um, one of them is like an official YouTube channel. There's the Creator Insider channel. I'm yeah. not sure if you've seen that. You've seen that? Yeah. Seen. yeah. It comes up. It just appears on the YouTube interface if you're uploading videos. Um, if you actually watch that, they tell you like what metrics you need and how you can help uh, improve those metrics and that kind of thing. Uh, so you can get actual good information. They don't really hide anything about the algorithm. Yeah, because they want to, um, you know, they want to make more business. They want to sell, they want to sell more ads. Yeah, and they want the people who are taking it seriously, who are, you know, trying to become good at making videos to actually know what will work well, because that'll just raise the bar for everyone. Yeah. Um, but most people won't actually do that research, right? So, yeah, so I, I think most people look at, uh, and even myself, when I first came to YouTube, I, as this algorithm is like algorithm, like black box, mm -hmm. what is this algorithm and this mysterious algorithm and how does it work? And, mm -hmm. and, and like, uh, is, is it a secret or do only a few people on the inside understand it? Yeah. I mean, that's the impression people had and they had the impression that YouTube was keeping it a secret on purpose so they could sort of you know, wield it over our heads as a weapon, but I don't think that's the case. I think they, they just um, didn't explain it. YouTube is kind of bad at communicating sometimes. So people don't know what's happening, but, but this channel, they actually do explain the algorithm and there are other like third-party channels where they do it in their own way. Like there's another channel I've been watching lately called channel makers. Okay. And um, the guy from that channel, like he, I don't know if he was a YouTuber before, but He's someone who just got very nerdy about, about what makes a YouTube channel successful. And he's looked at tons of data and he analyzes it and finds out what works and what doesn't and explains it in his videos. Great. Um, so, I'll, I'll link that uh, in the description. Yeah. So channel makers. Channel makers. Um, cool. So about starting a YouTube channel, like there's a difference, you know, like how people approach YouTube is basically, I guess, what we're talking about in terms of metrics and doing your research. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, there's different ways to go about YouTube, like some, like yourself, like you're a creator who puts in like a hundred hours and, you know, like, I think a lot of people have it backwards. Like maybe a lot of people will put in like uh, a one hour, two hours of research and maybe 10 hours of filming. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's different ways about how to go about YouTube. And, and if you go about doing it in certain ways, then you're going to give yourself a better, a better shot in 2022. Uh, even though it's, you know, the platform is very competitive. Like, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, there's different ways to, to be competitive. Like if you're going to be putting in like 20, 30, 40, 50 hours on a video, then, you know, that is going to help your chances. Right. Even mm -hmm. though it's 2022. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the amount of effort you're putting in, and if you're putting effort into the right things, like they, yes, that's that will... You can't just, you know, dig holes in the desert and expect to return. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I mean, YouTube is looking for specific things with those metrics that they that they look at. And if you keep those in mind while you're creating the content, um, you can make little adjustments that help you target those metrics, and that can make your videos do much better, right? So I'm, I'm becoming a lot more conscious of that these days. Um, it's partly because of I'm starting, well, I'm, I rebooted my second channel and I'm trying to sort of take that more seriously as a, you know, from a, a creator and business angle, not just from like a nerdy content creator <laughs> angle. And um, what's your second channel, Paul? Uh, it's called the GeoFocus channel. I started it like in 2015, back when I started LangFocus, just after, but I had to, I basically had to choose because it was taking too much time. So I focused on length focus because it was doing better at the time. Um, but yeah, these days I'm trying to do both again and I'm doing that by having a team for the second channel. Um, so I'm outsourcing uh, and I have a team 
of a few script writers and I have two video editors at the moment who help me work on the productions. So I oversee everything. I'm still involved in the scripts and I still um, give direction to the editors like in the form of production notes and, and that kind of thing. Um, but I don't do everything myself. I delegate some of the production. Uh, and I'm also just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give like limitations, put limitations on it. So it never gets to be out of control. Like Lang focus, Lang focus is just kind of too overwhelming at the moment. It's too detailed and the videos are hard to make. At least it so. seems like you're very, very much aware of where you sit with Lang focus and this new channel and, and, you know, so it seems like maybe, you know, I, I think you have a chance at cutting back on uh, or getting things in order with length focus because it seems like you're very aware. Yeah, I'm very aware of the, the, the negative side of it or the, you know, I'm, a better way to say it would be that I'm selling myself short on length focus by um, having, making the videos too complicated so that I can't outsource anything. Mm. Right now they're too complicated, so I can't, so the main focus is only as big as you right now. Like, that's right. And if you kind of uh, rein it in a little bit, you may be able to uh, make it bigger than yourself. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Exactly. Because um, there's only so much I can get done myself. And if right. the amount of work for each video gets bigger and bigger, it just takes longer and longer to do the videos. Um, yeah, so that's really the challenge I face with it. And it's because I never put limitations on the format. Um, but in, on the second channel, I decided, okay, like the, the range that I want is like eight minutes to 12 minutes, no longer for the videos. If they go longer, that's kind of like uh, unacceptable, um, right. that kind of thing. And I want all of the videos to, you know, be fairly simple, simple enough that someone who's never heard of this country can actually learn about it. That kind of thing. It's never overwhelming. Right. So I'm just, I'm keeping it simple and I'm keeping it under control. So that it's always, I'm always able to outsource part of the writing and part of the editing and have it never get, never have to be all me. Right? So it sounds like a, you're building a handbook uh, uh, of, of uh, how not to burn out. And right. maybe yeah. these lessons will hopefully trans translate into Lang Focus. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely using the second channel kind of as my laboratory at the moment. And I'm trying all sorts of different things and learning a lot from it. And I plan to, you know, apply a lot of that to Lang focus, um, you know, in the future. So right now it's just fun to try all these different things and seeing that they're working and that it's, it's easier to make videos that way. And that I think it's based on the way it's going now, it could become more successful than Lang focus. So if I go back and apply the same things to Lang focus too, then I can grow that more as well. Right. When it comes to outsourcing and a team, I think a lot of people also, you know, maybe it's a, uh, something that people would think, oh, well, if I just get a team and, and do outsourcing, then I'm going to be successful. But I, I mean, I, I think it doesn't really work that way. I think maybe you, you need to uh, discover a good few lessons on your own first before you jump in with a team, would, would, you, would you say? Yeah, I mean, some some people seem to start with a team right away, but maybe they've had business experience before and they're just used to directing people. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I think doing everything by myself on Lang Focus really taught me kind of what I want. Um, and what you don't want. And what I don't want, yeah. So it helps me to direct the, the team members. And it, it helps me to know, like, w w when they give me something, I know what to do with it. The first time I had someone edit a video for me, I was terrified. And when I watched it, I thought, oh my God, this is horrible. But um, it was horrible because of just like four things that I knew, you know, I, I knew what to tell. I knew um, how they could fix it. And if they changed these four things, the video would be 10 times better. Yes. Yeah, so you could give the proper note because of your experience. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, it was the most corporate looking video ever it didn't seem like anything made by an individual creator it was, it was like something made for a, a corporation or a tv commercial or and, and, like and, a, wanna, like, and i guess what you're saying is you want to you want to you know i guess you'll you you'll compromise a little bit but you want to keep your you want to have a certain voice in your, right in your, in your editing even even though it's done by a, a team or outsource yeah so i mean after that first video was just like me jumping in to see what happens and then figuring it out 
and then after that, I, I sort of taught the editors my style uh, from Lang Focus, but a little bit simplified and, and allowed them to add their creative spin on it. So it's interesting for them, but basically they're following this format that I created, uh, but I had to teach that to them and now they can execute it fairly easily. So it, it, it has, uh, it has caught on and it's uh, successful. It's working. Yeah, it's working. It's not getting as many views as Lang Focus yet, but it's getting, you know, this month it has a couple hundred thousand views, <laughs> which which isn't isn't bad for a channel that's just getting restarted. I take that, Paul. I take I take two hundred, couple hundred thousand views. Nothing, to, yeah. nothing new. Uh, yeah, nothing new. I feel shy about. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not profitable because I'm I'm paying the team members, so it's basically like I'm I'm using some of the revenue from Lang Focus to invest into the GeoFocus channel and and pay the, the team members. So the channel itself is not making money yet, but it's growing. And if it's getting a couple hundred thousand views after a few months, then you know, after another year or something, I'm sure it will be doing doing decently. Great. Um so do you find like value in collaborating with other YouTubers? I mean, I guess what I mean collaborating is like going on other people's channels like this or um going on other people's podcasts or even within the community, uh, getting advice or things like that. In terms of getting advice or just like networking with people and talking yeah. to them about what you do. I mean, definitely that's really useful. Um, I mean, I was part of like a, a mastermind group. I guess I'm technically still part of it, but their meeting times are like 3 a.m. in Japan at the moment. <laughs> but I'm part of this mastermind group of, of uh, language creators, content creators in the language space. And, and we meet and talk about our businesses and, and, um, and what we're doing and, and that kind of thing. So it's how really good. How did, how did you find the group? And is there, is there a lot of people in the group or? Um, there were, I think like 12 or 15 people in it. We'd meet on zoom in groups and then break off into breakout rooms. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. One of the guys who organizes it is Ollie Richards, um, mm -hmm. who has a fairly big YouTube channel and a big website about languages. Um, yeah, so that was really, really a good experience. Uh, just hearing about what other people are doing and having them ask me questions and getting their advice. And a lot of them have more business savvy than I do. Um, so I'm, you were one of the smaller ones in the group, like in terms of your channel and stuff and your business uh, experience? Not necessarily in terms of my channel size, but in terms of like business acumen, I guess I was you know, one of the less experienced. Um, so just hearing their questions, sometimes they had questions for me that I didn't know how to answer. And I, I knew, okay, I have to go figure out what to do about this. Um, and just hearing, I guess it's just motivating to talk to other people who are doing the same thing too. And when they talk to you, like you're, you know, like you're one of them, that makes a sort of shift in your mind. So I think that's sort of the benefit of networking and, and being part of a, a mastermind group like that. That sounds wow, these, very valuable. Yeah, I mean, because even though I have like 1.3 million subscribers, I don't really think of myself like that. But I look at other people on YouTube and I think, okay, they're doing well. Like they have big channels and they have this good business. So I kind of look up to them. And then if they talk to you and they they talk to you like you're in the same group and you're on the same level, it's like, oh, okay, click. Like I am kind of successful as a YouTube creator. So, you know, it breeds confidence. Yeah, exactly. So maybe I can uh, do what they're doing and take it to the next level, right? So yeah, that's definitely the, the good thing about networking with other people. Um, in terms of like actually making content together, I've done things like this where I, you know, appear on someone's podcast, but right. I've never really made a video with someone. Right. I think it's because just like we have our own processes and it's hard yeah. to sort of jump into someone else's process and not get in the way, yeah. right? Sounds like uh, what you do is, is is you know highly independent in terms of your research, uh, and as you said, like the, the most important thing is all the research that happens behind the scenes, like a hundred hours of research, right? Which is, is kind of difficult to. It would be just a task in itself to coordinate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So like, there's no way to really do like fifty fifty effort in a collaborative video. It would have to be like my video and someone is a guest or their video and I'm the guest, but like, how does someone fit in as a guest on my channel when I'm just like presenting information, right? Um, yeah, so it's kind of hard to, to figure that out. 
I've never really done that, but things like this, I think are good. And definitely networking with other people is good. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm new in the YouTube game, you know, I graduated from film school, but like it, in terms of graduating from film school, it really means nothing in terms of, uh, it's all about like the, all the things we've talked about today, about understanding the metrics and the value of story and, and things like that. So it's very, very helpful. And I hope uh, people will get some value from this for sure. Um, yeah, I hope so too. So you mentioned about running a business. Uh, Lang, so now that you're like a, basically a full-time business, like what are some challenges of, of, as, as being like a fully focused full-time business on YouTube? Um, well, I guess like I, I'm making a decent living from it, but I'm not making so much money that I can hire a bunch of people to do the things I don't want to do. So basically I'm wearing 20 hats. Like I'm the accountant, uh, I'm the social media manager, I'm the business manager who gets all the emails with business proposals. Like I'm doing all these things that are not content creation, even though like my real job is the content creation. Right. So it's difficult to juggle all those other things that are sort of peripheral to me, but need to get done. Like when, you know, when it's tax time, I have to do my taxes, even though I have a video that needs to be released really soon. <laughs> so exactly. that kind of thing is, is a big hassle. Um, yeah. And it's hard to do all that stuff. Well, if you're not focused on any one task, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, that's the jack of all trades. Right. Yeah. Jack of all trades, master of none, like <laughs> doing everything with low efficiency because I can't focus on any one thing. So in terms of like, you mentioned um, getting, you know, you're the one fielding all the proposals that people shoot out to you and emails and stuff like that. Um, how do you deal with sponsorships and brand collaborations? Like what are the pros and cons of that? Well, the pros of that, you can, you can get an extra income stream. Um, sometimes <laughs> you can get like a more than you would normally get from your, from your AdSense or whatever. Um, but I think it's important like to distinguish between a brand deal and affiliate marketing. Um, like affiliate marketing is when you get a commission, if you make a sale, if you recommend someone's product, um, and a brand deal is when they pay you a flat rate to promote their product. So I tend to, to. Uh, I tend to prefer doing affiliate marketing because I can do whatever I want with it. I don't have to promote it in a specific way and I don't have to disrupt my content in order to promote it. Yes. When you're getting a flat rate from someone, like if they're giving you X amount of dollars to promote their, their product, like they want you to do it well and they expect you to put everything else aside and do it. You have like, to interrupt the video and, and say like, you know, and then you have to talk about that product and that may annoy some of your viewers, right? Right. So if it's, if it's affiliate marketing and I only get paid if I get a commission, then it's up to me, right? They don't care if I, how I promote it. So I tend to just put it in the first 10 seconds of the video and then maybe something at the end. But if, if they're paying me like a lump sum, if it's a brand deal, they have specific requirements, right? They'll say like, no, we want you to introduce this product 90 seconds into the video. And it has to be like a two minute promotion. Wow. Like 90s, like that, that's like the, after the hook point, I guess. Right now the viewers are hooked. Now they, there's a two minute promotion in their face and a lot of them are going to leave. Right. So it reduces your retention rate. So if it reduces the retention rate, the video will be promoted less. You'll make less from advertising revenue. So you've got to balance like, uh, is it worth losing those viewers, losing the advertising revenue and potential like followers just for that lump sum of cash. Um, and yeah, maybe you, it is in the beginning when you're first uh, trying to put some investment in the channel, but I guess, like you said, it's always a, it's always a balancing act, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's okay to do it, but you have to keep in mind that there's a, there's a, a cost benefit, right? Like you, you're, you're losing something as well. You right. have to always keep that in mind that there's a cost to it. Um, so I don't want to do it too often. And also they often require you to do, well, if it's like, if it's, um, for example, a product promoted a product about the French language, if it's a French course that they want you to promote, then my video has to be about French, right? Of course. And I, I might not be, I might not want to, or it can be in the mood. Yeah. It might not be in my content plan to do French for the next few months. Right. But now I have to do it suddenly and that messes right. up my content plan or 
you know, the things I want to do. So I have to put everything aside for them. Now it's, it's usually not worth it for me. It has to be like a really good deal and something I really want to promote. Otherwise I'll just do affiliate marketing. So when you do affiliate marketing, do you call it like this? Do you say like, I, I see a lot of people saying this video is sponsored by Squarespace, Squarespace. I see Squarespace all over the internet. And I wonder like, is that like an actual sponsorship or is it an affiliate or, cause I think like I sometimes I'm confused in video, people's videos. Like they say it's sponsored by. Yeah. I mean, in the case of Squarespace, I'm not sure a lot of companies will do like a hybrid deal where they pay you some kind of flat fee, but then you also get a commission as well. Um, so Squarespace might be doing that. I think that's pretty common, um, but I'm not sure. Like sometimes I use the word sponsor when I do an affiliate uh, affiliate promotion. That's because I promote the same company most of the time. And I know the CEO of that company and I know their products and I use their products. So, uh, so I, because I'm in close contact with them, I call it, um, a sponsorship, even though I don't get a flat fee, they're not paying me like per month. I just get paid per sale of whatever people buy. So the, the company, the company wouldn't really mind, I guess, because you're just actually you're actually promoting them in a kind of a stronger way. Yeah, I don't think they mind, and I don't think um, I don't think they're really bothered by how I promote them as long as they get some sales, right? Exactly. Cool. Um, yeah. So getting back to what you said about like um, the cost benefit of. Uh, using ads or sponsorships in your videos. Mm -hmm. um, like right now, Netflix is going through that right now. Netflix just lost a massive amount of subscribers. Their stock, their stock is tanking. And now they're flirting the idea of uh, ad supported uh, uh, revenue, which is going to, you know, like you said, it's going to be like a massive cost benefit uh, decision right there, because that's going to like knock some people, more subscribers off the channel. So they're, they're planning on maintaining the paid tier with no ads and introducing ads for free viewers? Yes. I, mm -hmm. I mean, they're talking about the possibility. I don't know if they're going to go through with that, but mm -hmm. um, it's a big, you know, it's a big debate, I'm sure, within their team. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you look at YouTube, YouTube has YouTube premium, which is ad free, but very few people actually pay for YouTube premium. Exactly. Most people are willing to tolerate the ads or some people block the ads. Um, so yeah, there definitely is that, that trade-off. Definitely. So, so Paul, as your channel grows, what can we expect from Lang Focus in the next five years, let's say? Or even if you want to do like near-term first and then long-term. Right. Um, well, I guess it's more of the same, pretty much. I mean, I'm going to keep going down my list of topics that I'm interested in that I want to cover and I'll do more interesting language videos, topics that are interesting to me and hopefully to other people. Um, so I think it's kind of more of the same, but I do intend to adjust the format a little bit so that it's more sustainable long-term um, and use some of the lessons from the second channel, the GeoFocus channel, uh, in terms of outsourcing and, and that sort of thing to make it more sustainable for myself. And I think that would have the added benefit of also opening up the channel to a more mainstream audience, like a, a, a wider audience that can't get into the, the nerdy details of each language. Right. <laughs> how about like, are you thinking like maybe even like building out a studio, like more of, I'm, I'm not sure how, where you film now, like in your house or how you do it, but like, are those cards in the, in the plans as well? Um, I'm pretty happy to, to film at home um, in my I current mean, like place. Yeah, I've got like a home studio, like I've got this office for like, this is my editing room, basically this little nice. office space. I do my research here and my editing here. And I've got one bedroom in this house, which is, which is my studio filming studio. Excellent. It's not huge. I would like it to be a little bigger, but for now it'll do. With um, time, with time. Yeah. So one thing I've, I've talked about with my wife, is like the possibility of if we have another child in the future and we we don't have enough bedrooms in the house. I might rent something nearby. I might rent an apartment and turn that into a studio, or I might get some other sort of filming space, some other rental space that yeah. I can use as a studio. Yeah, like uh, I've seen some YouTubers, they uh, rent apartments and 
they film there. They, they mm. have the whole apartment to, to film their videos and as it's just a place to kind of get away. Right. Yeah. So that's an option. That's something I might do like if we need to use that room and it, I might be able to get a bigger room if I do it that way. Awesome. It's, it's, awesome. That's, it's a little bit awkward standing in these small little, small little bedrooms, right? Like you can't be too close to the camera True. because then you're, you're only showing like your shoulders and head, but then you can't be too close to the green screen behind you because then it's hard to remove the green screen. You'll have this green halo around you, um, which I've had in some of my recent videos and I don't like it. So, <laughs> so yeah, it would be nice to have a bit more space. Well, Paul, we're looking forward to uh, whatever you do on laying focus and how, whatever your setup may be. Um, so I guess this is the last question is like, where, uh, what are you working on right now? If you can say, and where can people find you on uh, social media? And whatever you, uh, I'll, of course, I'll link to whatever you say in the description. Yeah, the, I guess, like I mentioned before, I mentioned my second channel, which is the thing I'm kind of excited about right now, um, the GeoFocus channel. And on, I haven't really talked about what it is, but on that channel, I basically talk about different countries instead of different languages. So right. I'm covering the, the countries of the world. So it's like a geography channel, but I also cover like history and culture and economy and different aspects of each country. Nice. And I might make some videos about different geopolitical issues and that sort of thing as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if those channels are uh, quite, you know, quite popular now these days as well. People are dying yeah, everything on YouTube these days. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of channels like that. Lang Focus was kind of really unique when I started it. There was nothing else like that that covered just languages in general in that style there are more geography type channels so there's more competition but i'm covering it i'm doing it in my own way with my own style some people like that style and some people resonate with me so i know it, it will find its audience and, and you have a base as well from lang focus which will help right yeah so a certain percentage of them it's probably a small percentage but some of them will move over to the second channel as well um and then it will develop its own audience through searches and recommended videos and that kind of thing. Right. So yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with that and just learning a lot that I can use for both channels. Excellent. All right, Paul, uh, I gotta say, man, thank you so much. I learned a lot today and uh, it was nice having you on the show and uh, best of luck with uh, your channels and your, the new family. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was good to be here. All right. Take care. You too.